Now, let's look ahead to the future from this point on. First is seen by the man some call the number one futurist around. He's Isaac Isaac Asimov, author of more than 250 books, light and heavy, fiction and nonfiction, some of the most notable being about the future, the Asimov vision of it at least. Technologically, let's see what major developments you see coming, Mr. Asimov. For, ex for instance, in space, anything left out there that you see coming still? Oh, everything. So far, we have only been exploring space. We are still in the Christopher Columbus stage as far as space is concerned. What remains now is to actually make use of space, to get out and stay there more or less permanently, to set up space stations, to build solar power stations, to uh, have laboratories and factories that can do things in space that are difficult or impossible to do on Earth, and eventually to have space settlements in which thousands of people can be housed more or less permanently. Do you think that's actually going to happen, or is that just a po I mean, it's possible to do it, but do you think it's actually going to happen in these next several years? Well, as to whether it's actually going to happen, that's the choice that humanity has to make. We can decide not to do it, but we can also decide to do it because the technology is there. It would be expensive, require a great deal of time, energy, manpower, etc., but on the whole, not as much expense and effort and emotional input as, for instance, to maintain our military machines year after year. So if, we could, if we could put in half a trillion dollars a year on space instead mm -hmm. of on military machines, there are almost no limits to what we can do. But what's the point of it? What's the point of doing all that? Well, for one thing, we'll gain new sources of energy, new sources of materials, we'll gain new knowledge, we'll make new technologies possible. We'll be moving out from an Earth which is relatively worn out by thousands of years of human depredations. They're not vicious depredations necessarily, just the fact we've been living here and making use of its resources into, into new territory mm -hmm. and be able to build a larger and more elaborate civilization and one which does not depend upon the resources of one world. All right, speaking of what might happen, though, back here on Earth, uh, the computers. Uh, computers have really, really come into their own in these last uh, few years. What do you see ahead for the computer age? Have we crested on that one as well? Oh, no, no, no. The computer is at the center of everything. The computer is a problem-solving device. It is a technique that makes it possible to do things that would be utterly impossible without it. We couldn't reach the moon without mm. the computer. We require the computer to handle these spaceships that we're making use of. Everything we do in space, we won't be able to do without banks of computers doing thinking faster than we possibly can. And in the same way, the advance of robots depends entirely upon the computer. In fact, the simplest way of defining a robot is as a computerized machine. Do you see a time where computers at, at the basic human level, in homes and that sort of thing, will, that everybody will have a computer? We'll have to have computers in order to ex exist and make it down here on Earth? It's not even a matter of having to have. They'll want to. Uh, when, when television first came in in 1948, it was easy to predict that everybody would want to have a television set simply because it was primarily used for entertainment. Well, uh, computers are going to be necessary in the house to do a great many things, some in the way of entertainment, some in the way of making life a little easier, and everyone will want it. And the home computer will, is the wave of the future. What do you see? Uh, you mentioned robots, and uh, we saw at the beginning that uh, the, there were a lot of scary things involved in the 20s when predicting the, the, uh, the coming of the robot. What do you see the robot's place being in our future? Well, it's scary, but not for the reasons they always saw it. They saw the robots as being somehow hu imitation human beings that were vicious and soulless. Mm -hmm. That's not so. Uh, we now know that robots are simply machines that do what they're told to do, but they replace human beings. It's not that they kill them, but they kill their jobs. Uh, they'll create more jobs than they kill, but they'll be different jobs. And the people whose jobs are lost may not easily be edu educational, educatable, educable, there mm -hmm. it is, okay. uh, into new jobs. 
Uh, so that we are going to have to accept an important role, society as a whole, in making sure that the transition period from the pre-robotic uh, technology to the post-robotic technology is as painless as possible. We have to make sure that people aren't treated as though they're used up dish rags, that they have to be allowed to live and retain their self-respect. Work has to be found for them. Those who can be educated into new jobs should be. Those who can be transferred, fitted in somewhere else, should be. Uh, this is not going to be easy, and the transition period will be starting almost at once. Finally, let me ask you this. In a word, Mr. Asimov, when you look ahead to the future, do you see, see the world in optimistic terms? I mean, you see good things ahead. Would you, would you classify yourself as being an optimistic futurist? I'm a hopeful optimist. In other words, I hope things will be optimistic. It is up to humanity to make the decisions. We can decide to specialize in hatred and suspicion and end up with a nuclear war which will destroy everything, or we can decide to cooperate and overcome our suspicions and hatreds, in which case I see an endlessly receding horizon with no foreseeable way of coming to an end to greatness. Thank you. The, the threat of nuclear war, it's something that, that has very much been in the public mind uh, in the last several months, uh, as you know. I want to start with you and ask what each of you, when you look in your crystal balls, what do you see in that regard? Well, with regard to nuclear war, the first thing I see is that 40 years has passed and no one has had the nerve to start one. I see a public opinion which every year becomes more alive to the dangers thereof and more insistent that the risks be lowered. Uh, it's just a question as to whether uh, the general public perception of nuclear war as something that must not happen can overcome the, what I might call, the conventional military mind. Of all the things that you see in the future, what excites you the most as, as a person? I mean, just, just really turns you on when you think about it if this wonderful thing could happen? Oh, what excites me most is the thought of an understanding of the human brain far deeper than any we have now. I'm hoping that by the use of computers, that perhaps by the construction of artificial intelligence, we can be able to understand the most complex conglomeration of matter that we know of, the human brain, which is at one and the same time our greatest hope and our greatest danger. It's in the brain that all advances can be planned. It's in the brain that all dangers can be expected. And I want to understand that. In 1902, this was a French filmmaker's fanciful view of the future. As we know, his vision of flying to the moon wasn't so crazy. But what are today's visionaries predicting for the future? Good evening. 1982 has been a year of remarkable developments in science and technology. The first permanent artificial heart is working inside the chest of Barney Clark. Genetic engineering has produced a new jumbo-sized mouse. Just this week, scientists at Princeton, for the first time, successfully tested a fusion reactor, perhaps the precursor of a safer, cheaper form of nuclear energy. Robots began taking the place of men in U.S. auto plants, and Time magazine selected the computer as its man of the year. Each one of these advances seemed impossibly romantic only a few decades ago. But as technology advances, so does the art of predicting future advances. And we thought New Year's Eve an appropriate time to look at how accurate some of the visionaries of the past have been and what current futurists see ahead of us. Robin, it's always been a mixed bag when it comes to visionaries and their visions. In the early 1900s, the populace was gripped for a while by wild and scary predictions about mechanical people, robots. The word robot was coined, in fact, in a very downbeat 1921 play called RUR, for Rossum's Universal Robots which ended with an earth occupied only by mechanical people, the humankind having destroyed themselves. 
A few years later, the German filmmaker Fritz Lang created his vision of Metropolis, where a mad scientist creates a robot to replace enslaved human workers, all of whom would be eliminated as a cost-saving measure. But in 1955, a not-so-mad real-life scientist shared a vision that proved to be right on the mark, remarkably so. The scientist was Werner von Braun, and he did it on a Walt Disney television program called Man in Space. Let's look ahead a few years and see how this might be accomplished. Twenty-five years later, the actual photographs of the U.S. Space Shuttle mission were stunningly similar to these make-believe ones. In the 1930s, there was a wave of exuberant and sometimes outlandish predictions about what the future would look like. For example, they thought skyscrapers were doomed and would be replaced by vast underground cities. Some thought that flying would become as common as driving and that we would all have our own personal auto planes. But some of the predictions came very close to the mark. They envisioned, for example, harnessing the power of the sun for energy, the forerunner to today's solar power. Then there was the projection that one day man would be able to capture movies on common phonograph records. That's only now coming into popular use in today's video discs. 